Hello, my name is Max Wintermark. I'm uh, the Chief of Neuroradiology at the University of Virginia, and today we are going to have our first lec lecture on intracranial hemorrhages. This will be the first, again, of a series of lectures dedicated to this topic, and uh, today we are going to uh, remain quite at a general level to review the different uh, imaging patterns associated with the different types of uh, intracranial hemorrhages. And we're going to try to really put ourselves in the, a typical clinical setting where um, basically the, the emergency physician has ordered uh, a CT or an MRI study of the brain in a patient suspected of stroke. And uh, this study shows the presence of blood. And now it's the role of the radiologist to basically tell the clinician what's the likely origin of that particular bleed, uh, because uh, each different type of bleed will basically prompt a different uh, treatment. And uh, so the, the radiologist is really playing an important role from uh, this perspective. In subsequent lecture, we'll take each of those possible types of intracranial hemorrhage, and we'll discuss them in more depth. But today, um, you can see here the list of the different types of hemorrhage that we're going to review. The first one that we're going to focus uh, our attention on is uh, traumatic brain, is related to traumatic brain injury because that's the most common type uh, of intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, usually when, some, when a radiologist is dealing with a, a traumatic intracranial hemorrhage, there is not a lot of doubt regarding the origin of that particular hemorrhage. The role of the radiologist in that setting is more to differentiate between different types, subtypes of traumatic intracranial hemorrhage because each of those subtypes has a different prognosis and as a result is uh, taken care of differently by the emergency physician and the neurosurgeon. So the first type of uh, hemorrhage that we're going to discuss is epidural uh, hematoma. There are several characteristics that are uh, typical for epidural hematoma. So the first thing is that it typically, as you can see here, happen at the site of the coup. Um, it's associated with a fracture. You can see two fractural lines uh, in those two locations. Then another uh, Typical characteristic of this uh, epidural hematoma is that it's biconvex in shape, so it has this uh, lens shape that I'm uh, drawing uh, here. The epidural hematomas cannot cross sutures, but they can cross dural attachments. So typically an epidural hematoma is going to possibly extend from the right to the left hemisphere. It's possibly going to extend from the middle to the posterior cranial uh, fossa. And we're going to see that all those characteristics are uh, different from the other subtype of traumatic intracranial hemorrhage that is subdural uh, hematomas. In terms of uh, profile and uh, prognosis, uh, epidural hematomas tend to happen in relatively young patients. And uh, as a result, because the underlying brain is normal, they tend to have a relatively good prognosis. They're going to be quite symptomatic, but if they are taken care of uh, in a timely fashion and properly, the, the, and which means that if they're evacuated quickly, which is the most often treatment, the most often selected treatment option, the outcome is quite good. Now, if we want to differentiate uh, epidural from subdural hematoma, so the subdural hematoma is kind of uh, exactly the opposite. So first, instead of happening at the site of the coup, uh, as is the case for uh, an epidural hematoma, it happens at the site of the contra coup, as you can see uh, here. So that's a, a first thing to, to uh, notice. Then the second thing is that there is usually no fracture, so there's nothing I can point at because there is usually no fracture uh, associated, and we'll come back to that when we'll discuss typically the, the, the group, the patient population in which uh, subdural hematomas often happen. Then the shape is quite different. You can see that it's not anymore this biconvex lens, it's instead this crescentic uh, shape that we have. And we had seen that for epidural hematomas, they were not able to cross sutures, but they were able to cross dural attachments. So it's exactly the opposite for subdural hematomas. As you can see here, they can cross sutures. This, this is the frontal uh, 
the, the coronal suture, and you can see that the subdural hematoma extends through it. And you can see that, on the other hand, subdural hematomas are not able to cross dural attachment. They are going to extend along them. So, for instance, they are going to extend along the folds, as demonstrated here, or they are going to extend here along the tentorium. Uh, subdural hematomas tend to happen uh, in uh, either uh, neonates or in older patients, and their common characteristic is that for different reasons their brain volume is relatively small compared to the, 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 the capacity of the skull, and as a result the brain can kind of move within the skull, and the dural venous attachment can get torn, and that's what is causing the subdural hematoma. Uh, it's a venous origin rather than an arterial origin like for uh, epidural hematoma. So the first reaction would be to think that they actually have a better prognosis, but it's actually exactly the opposite. And the reason for that is, again, because often we're dealing with older patients, the underlying brain is already abnormal at baseline, and because of the uh, additional stress and ischemia caused by the subdural hematoma, uh, usually the, the, the brain is doing uh, more poorly and the outcome is less good. There's one thing that uh, both uh, epidural and subdural uh, hematomas have in common, and it's uh, the, the signal. So there's this typical relationship if I try to plot the, um, if I try to plot the, um, the, the CT, density in function of the time, I have typically this decreasing uh, line. So at the beginning, the blood tends to be bright, and then uh, after several days or week, uh, it becomes kind of iso uh, dense to the brain tissue, and then finally it becomes hypo dense uh, uh, on a longer time frame of several months uh, if it doesn't get completely resorbed. But there's one exception to that rule. One, uh, one has to remember that in the very acute phase, actually, the blood can also be. Uh, hypodense. And as a result, when you see a pattern like that, where you have some areas like here that are relatively uh, hypodense, and some other areas like this one, which are uh, hyperdense, you shouldn't be, as the, the, the radiologist looking at this uh, CT scan, you shouldn't be falsely reassured thinking that you are dealing with something acute and chronic. You should think that this area here that is uh, hypodense is actually uh, quite uh, hyperacute, which means that the this hematoma is actively bleeding and you can expect it to, to grow in size and you can see that there's already a significant amount of mass effect, there's midline shift as you can see here, the ventricle are compressed, there's already a little bit of entrapment of the left lateral ventricle, so all those things should raise your degree of concern, except, ex especially because we know it's going to get worse. This sign is called the swirl sign. So those were two uh, quite frequent type of uh, hematomas in the setting of trauma. There are others. Uh, one uh, other type is this diffuse axonal injury, also called traumatic axonal injury. Um, here I'm showing you a pattern where you have some petechial hemorrhages at the gray-white matter junction, like for instance here uh, or here. Uh, also in the dorsolateral midbrain in that particular region. You are going to catch those petechial hemorrhage particular emerges even better on this gradient echo sequence from MRI where they bloom and they appear as those dark spots also in the same location. Again, the orsolateral midbrain, gray-white matter junction could also be the corpus callosum. One has to remember, though, that this pattern is the exception rather than the rule. The rule is that you don't see anything on the non-contrast CT and on the conventional sequences in MR when you have diffuse axonal injury. And the, the tip here is that usually you have quite a discrepancy between the very poor clinical picture and the relatively normal brain imaging. And you need either to have to use those uh, gradient echo images that are very sensitive to blood products, or you need to be able to use diffusion to be able to detect those microscopic traumatic injury. Again, that will be the topic of a whole uh, chapter in and it by itself, several presentations on that topic, so that's all what I want to say uh, at this point of this presentation. We are then moving on to a different type of intracranial hemorrhage. So now we are more in this setting that I described earlier where you diagnose a bleed and the clinician asks you, but what do you think is the likely origin? So there are two types that I want to oppose to each other. The first type is arterial hypertension, and I'm going to discuss uh, in a minute amyloid angiopathy. But to come back to uh, arterial hypertension, the typical characteristic is you are dealing with a relatively young patient, 40, 50-year-old. You have one big 
confined hematoma typically located in the basal ganglia. Can also be lobar, but can also be uh, uh, is most likely located in the basal ganglia. Notice this pearl here with this extension of the, the hematoma here in the choroid plexus on the left. So those are kind of the typical features. Um, amyloid angiopathy, we are dealing with something different. So this time you have a much older patient, typically 80, 90 year old. It will be rare to consider the diagnosis of amyloid angiopathy in a young patient, typically 40, 50. That's highly unlikely, except if they have some predisposing genetic conditions. Uh, so that's the first characteristic, older patient, 80, 90 year old. Um, second characteristic, you can see that the underlying brain parenchyma is usually in poor condition. You have a lot of white matter disease, and that's a sign that you have some kind of angiopathy. You don't know yet that it's amyloid angiopathy, but it's a sign of angiopathy. So that's the second characteristic feature. And finally, you have this big hematoma that is typically in a lower uh, location. Last thing you can have uh, that is demonstrated on this specimen, you can also have some petechial hemorrhages in that uh, situation. If you want to depict them on imaging, you are again going to use this gradient echo sequence and you are going to have those petechial uh, hemorrhages. Again, that's something that uh, we'll come back to because we have seen those petechial hemorrhages with traumatic brain injury. We see them now with amyloid angiopathy. They could have happened with hypertension and there's a series of other conditions where you can encounter them. Their distribution is the clue to uh, how to differentiate those different conditions from each other. But again, that will be the topic of a dedicated presentation. Uh, to move on to the next topic, so uh, intracranial hemorrhage uh, caused by uh, ruptured intracranial aneurysm. Typically, then, the distribution of the blood, like demonstrated here, is in the subarachnoid uh, spaces. You can see here that on that particular uh, image there is an area that is relative, that is hyperdense, but relatively hypodense compared to the rest of the subarachnoid blood. That's probably the location of the aneurysm, and this is confirmed on the CTA where you can see nicely this supraclinoid ICA uh, aneurysm. So typically here, again, in terms of the distribution of the blood, subarachnoid, intraventricular, sometimes also intraparenchymal. Uh, depending on the orientation of the aneurysm and uh, depending on the direction in which it uh, ruptures. Uh, one has to remember that uh, the different things that I would like to mention at uh, this point, uh, aneurysm are one type of uh, uh, vascular malformation of the, 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 the brain. There are other types, but that will be again the topic of a different presentation. So that was the first thing. Second thing is you have to remember that not every subarachnoid hemorrhage is caused by your ruptured intracranial aneurysm. You can have subarachnoid hemorrhage in the setting of trauma. So that's uh, sometimes a complex situation because you have this patient with a trauma with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And it's a question of the, the chicken and the egg. You know, did the patient have a ruptured aneurysm that caused him to lose consciousness and then have the accident? Or did it just bled because of the accident? And usually the later is the most uh, frequent situation. There's usually no underlying aneurysm. There are some exceptions, and we'll review that when we we'll discuss uh, head trauma. Um, uh, another type of subarachnoid hemorrhage is this paramesencephalic venous subarachnoid hemorrhage. So typically, here the, the clinical scenario is that you have a patient with, again, the worst headache uh, of his or her life. So that matches what you would have in the setting of a ruptured aneurysm. But when you do the imaging, you observe that you have only a small amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's typically located uh, in the paramesencephalic cistern. And then those patients undergo the typical workup to rule out an intracranial aneurysm. So they get a CTA, it's negative. Then they undergo a first uh, angiogram, cerebral angiogram. It's negative and it's repeated at one week and it's again negative. And then usually you, you conclude that there's no underlying aneurysm, that the origin is not arterial, but that it's rather venous. And if you look very carefully at your uh, CTA or at your CT venogram, you can usually depict an abnormal vein. In that case, you see in a normal patient, you have here the, the basal vein of horizontal draining in the vein of Galen and in the straight sinus. You you can see that in this abnormal patient with the, the permanent venous subarachnoid emerge, the, ven, uh, the basal vein of horizontal drains straight in the superior sinus. So it's not uh, the conventional drainage. People think that this generates a little bit of 
uh, increased venous pressure and that in certain settings that can lead to those uh, subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage uh, of venous origin. Uh, two good things is that usually those patients uh, develop no complications, so no vasospasm, no aneurysm, the amount of blood is too small and their outcome is really excellent. So it's just more of a big fear that they might have been an aneurysm, so you have to rule that out, but other than that, their outcome is excellent. So we're moving on with our list of differential diagnoses. We have seen trauma, we have seen arterial hypertension, we have seen amyloid angiopathy, we have seen vascular malformation of the brain and some variants. Um, now we have here this other pattern. You can see that the pattern is quite different. So the first thing is instead of having a big kind of round compact hematoma, you instead have, you know, those patchy uh, hemorrhages in the brain. You can also see that the intervening brain parenchyma is not normal, it's hypodense. And finally, when you look at the distribution, it's not uh, an arterial distribution. It looks more like a venous distribution. And those are the characteristics of venous hemorrhagic infarcts. We'll have a specific presentation where we'll discuss cortical and venous sinus thrombosis. We'll review also those venous infarct, what are the venous territories. So all of that will be discussed uh, in great uh, detail. And uh, here's an example of uh, uh, venous thrombosis. And I wanted just to remind shortly that the, the thrombosinus is going to be spontaneously hyperdense. And that on uh, a CT venogram or post contrast CT, you have typically this triangular filling defect, also called the delta sign, when you use an imaging plane perpendicular to the sinus. Um, finally, a couple of, um, I would say, almost diagnosis of exclusion, you know, so the, the first one is when you have an intracranial hemorrhage. Of course, one thing that always comes to mind is does the patient have an underlying brain tumor? That's why often you, you think about the other etiology, you try to, to tag these other etiologies because then you can, uh, you know, with relative certainty rule out an underlying brain tumor. Sometimes you cannot, sometimes you are going to need to do uh, additional imaging uh, because indeed the underlying uh, mass, the underlying tumor can be quite subtle and obscure by the blood products. Uh, it may not be able, it may not be very easy to see on CT. Sometimes it can also even be challenging on MR. And that's why when you have to do the MR, if you can wait a couple of days and uh, let the time to the blood products to get resolved, it's even better that will increase your sensitivity. Sometimes we do it right away, but then you have to keep in mind that you might miss something uh, subtle. Here you can see what this bleed in the region of the third ventricle, and there was this underlying area of abnormal first signal. No, not really any abnormal enhancement. This patient had a low-grade glial tumor that had uh, bled. Finally, uh, the last thing that I want to remind is that uh, not everything that is bright on CT in the brain is necessarily blood. So something to remember, uh, at, in CT, in radiology in general, we are looking at contrasts. Uh, when something is bright, it may be that this structure is bright, but it may also be that the uh, adjacent structures are dark. And in that particular case, that's exactly what we are having. So this is a pattern of pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage. It seems indeed that there is again blood in the subarachnoid spaces. But actually, in that particular patient, the abnormality is not in the subarachnoid space. The abnormality is the brain tissue that is too dark, too hypodense. You can see that you, we can ba barely see the basal ganglia. You cannot really see any gray-white matter um, differentiation. And this is the clue together usually with a very characteristic uh, clinical history, a cardiac arrest, and unsuccessful uh, CPR that tells you that you are dealing with pseudo subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage. Um, so um, this concludes uh, this uh, lecture. So those are the entities that we uh, have been able uh, to see. Uh, traumatic brain injury, arterial hypertension, amyloid angiopathy, vascular malformation, venous infarct, coagulopathy could mimic anything, and hemorrhagic uh, brain tumor. And also remember those mimic mimicking entities such as sub pseudo subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see you for the next presentation.